I call to order the uh, regular session of the regular city council meeting Monday, June 19th. It is uh, 5.35 p.m. Please uh, silence your cell phones or put them on vibrate to uh, limit interruptions. Moving on to item number one on the agenda, that is the roll. Burlingame? Here. Evans? Here. Janser? Olson? Here. Pittner? Here. Pajagula? Here. Ross? Here. Number two, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Let's move on to uh, item number three on the agenda, and that is the mayor's report since the last meeting. Uh, it's been, uh, been fairly busy. We've uh, I've attended uh, some special meetings on a special fundraising project that we got going uh, to support the families of the Monad Air Force Base. There'll be more news on that uh, shortly down the road. Had some speaking engagements uh, with the Republican women, speaking engagement to the Chamber Board of Directors, a few coffee clubs, uh, attended a Task Force 21 meeting uh, uh, in uh, a yeah, private party at uh, the new restaurant at the Monad Country Club. Also spoke to uh, uh, veterans at the uh, Flag Day celebration at uh, one of the Ryan family dealerships, one-on-ones with the city manager and city attorney. A welcome this weekend to the Grand Lodge of the uh, annual communication with the Masons. Uh, and then this weekend in town was busy. I attended a softball tournament, 48 teams, 15 of those teams were from Canada, a baseball tournament, and I also attended an air show. So. Are there any questions or comments? I do want to take this opportunity to, to uh, uh, we lost a, a member, you, you know, being a, um, uh, whether it's the mayor or city council, your family plays a big role in, in who you are and what you do and, and their commitment to it. And I know uh, uh, Councilman Pittner lost his uh, father and they had a celebration of life for his dad here last week. Uh, I just wanna reach out to Paul. I attended the celebration. And uh, you know, the one thought that comes to mind is uh, the best testimony about a man is the legacy he leaves behind and, uh, and the gift for us all. And on one hand, Paul, I, I never physically met your dad. However, on the other hand, I believe I see the best parts of your dad every first and third Monday at the city council throughout the year. So. Uh, speaking on behalf of the entire council, Paul, our thoughts and prayers and uh, with you and your family. And, and once again, it was a, a beautiful celebration of his life. So with that, um, we will move on to item number four on the agenda, and that is the city council or the city manager's report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, members of the council, I'll keep it brief this evening. Uh, as always, uh, outlined in the city manager report as part of the packet, which is available to the public on the website, is a pretty extensive report, uh, including from my office. I do want to highlight, though, uh, one key element in there, and that being that uh, given the recent approval of the council at the special council meeting with regards to restructuring of the public works department, that uh, we have moved forward with uh, the advertising of positions and filling of those positions. And the first of those to have been filled is the utility director position, uh, which has been offered to and accepted by the assist current assistant public works director, uh, Mr. Jason Sorensen. So I wanted to congratulate him publicly on accepting that position. Uh, we'll also continue to work on uh, the rest of the restructuring and the preparation for the retirement of Dan Jonason as our public works director. Uh, which will include me also um, designating Mr. Sorensen as the interim public works director uh, effective immediately. And that's to provide some time for Mr. Jonason and, and uh, Mr. Sorensen to, to collaborate and make sure that transition goes as smoothly as possible here over the next several weeks. Uh, but uh, the public works director position is now posted and available for application on the city's website. And uh, staff is also working with trying to find a recruiter for recruitment of the assistant city manager position. 
So I just wanted to provide that report to the council and congratulate Mr. Sorensen on his appointment of our newest department director as the utilities director. Be happy to answer any questions uh, the council may have uh, on any matters in their memo or not relating to the memo. Are there any questions of the city manager? If not, we will move on to uh, item number five on the agenda, and that is uh, consider the report to the Planning Commission, item 5.1, a public hearing on zoning map amendment and preliminary plat on 55th crossing, ninth edition. Now is the time uh, for those who wish to speak either for or against uh, 5.1, the, the zoning map amendment and preliminary plat to 55th crossing and ninth edition. Second call for anyone wishing to vote, uh, or wishing to speak either in favor of or against uh, the zoning map preliminary plat. Final call. If not, what are the wishes of the council? Move that we close the public hearing and approve the item with recommendations from staff. Got a motion by Paul. Is there a second? Second. Second by Lisa. Is there any discussion? There's no discussion. Please call the roll. Pittner? Yes. Pajagula? Yes. Ross? Yes. Burlingame? Yes. Evans? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Moving on to 5.2 major, major subdivision preliminary plat, S and J subdivision. What are the wishes of the council? Move approval. Got a motion by Lisa, is there a second? Second. Second by Paul. Is there any discussion? No discussion. Please call the roll. Olson? Yes. Pittner? Yes. Pajagula? Yes. Ross? Yes. Burlingame? Yes. Evans? Yes. Janser? Yes. Moving on to uh, item six on the agenda is the consent items. We have 21 items on the consent agenda. We have been asked to pull 6.20 uh, for further discussion. Is there any other items on the consent agenda that need to be pulled at this time? If not, what are the wishes of the council? Move approval on all of the items except for 6.2. We have a motion by Lisa, is there a second? I'll second. Second by Scott, any discussion? Mr. Mayor, yes. I'll Go be on. abstaining from this vote. Okay. It does not include. Ald Alderman Pittner, this is the consent agenda. Oh, so your item will be okay. voted on. Yep. Never yep. mind, I'll vote on this one. <laughs> <laughs> any further discussion? If not, please call the roll. Olson? Yes. Pittner? Pajagula? Yes. Ross? Yes. Burlingame? Yes. Evans? Yes. Janser? Yes. Motion carried. Moving on to uh, item 6.2. Approve the application of FI9 facade improvement uh, program for the John Pittner Trust. John Pittner Trust and Irene Pittner Trust located at 111 Main Street South in an amount not to exceed $100,000. Mr. Oh. Mayor, I will be abstaining from this vote. <laughs> Move approval. Motion to it. Do we need a vote and approval on that? Yes. First, okay, so we have a motion to approve. Is there a second? A second. S second by Scott. Any further discussion? No further discussion. Please call the roll. Olson? Yes. Pajagula? Yes. Ross? Yes. Burlingame? Yes. Evans? Yes. Janser? Yes. Now, was that just to approve his abstaining, or did that? That approved. That, approved the item. Um, that was the item. That's okay. The item. okay that's, yep. Just wanted clarification. I didn't want to jump ahead. Let's move on to uh, action items. Uh, item number seven, seven point one, ordinance fifty eight forty, human relations committee. Um, Make a motion to approve this ordinance on second reading. We have a motion to approve. Is there a second? Yeah. I'll second. Whoop. I believe. Oh, we're good. Was this tabled? Steph, I believe. Don't we have another process we have to do since it was tabled with a motion on the table? So. 
So a motion on the to on the table can remain on the table. Oh, okay. So at this point, the motion that's before the council is to approve the ordinance on second reading. That needs to be seconded. I think uh, Dr. Dr. Steve. Okay. So that's the motion before the council at this time. Okay. Because the motions that were on the table have not been brought off before that motion was made. Oh, okay. Thank you. Should that motion fail, we could revisit the motions that are on the table. Okay. So we have a motion in a second. And um, before we get into um, discussion, I guess I just want to uh, bring up the fact that, uh, you know, this has been out there in the public for, uh, I think, well over a month. And uh, we have all had opportunity to, uh, with emails, public comment, phone calls. So unless there is some compelling argument uh, from the council uh, to open it up for further, um, I think we should just uh, move with discussion within the council and move to a vote. Mr. Mayor. Lisa. I do believe that there are people here this evening that have not had the opportunity to speak to us, so I think that they should be given that opportunity. Okay, anyone else? Steve. I would agree with Lisa. Okay. By a show of hands, who wishes to speak uh, to address the council? Who has not addressed the council uh, on this topic in the past? Okay, we will, uh, we will, if you have not addressed the council in the past on this topic, we will allow for public comment, uh, not to exceed five minutes uh, per individual. So if you wish to address the council at this time, you can step forward to the podium. Hello, I'm Aaron Michaels. I live in Southeast Minot. Uh, I'm here talking against the Olson, uh, not amendment, but proposal. Uh, one thing I was here last week, a lot of people kept saying, let the state and federal government handle this, the already in place laws. A lot of what's in this ordinance is not covered by state or federal law. I couldn't find any. What I did find with federal law is for federal employees. We are not in federal employees. So those people who keep saying it's in state and federal mandate, it is not. It's good for us to cover these things. The other part of it is a lot of people weren't mentioning the part of the ordinance they're against. Let's not fool ourselves. It's the LGBTQ section okay this is not a problem with most young people they see the laws that go against what they believe is archaic they don't want to stay somewhere that is outdated and archaic i don't want to be somewhere like that so in order to get new blood and those that are already here to stay here, we need to understand that most young people don't have a problem with LGBTQ people. I'm not saying that it's something that only older people have to deal with, there are plenty of young people, but the vast majority, and me as a teacher, I have seen it, don't have an issue with LGBTQ kids, adults, any of it. Uh, if you went and saw the Pride Festival, the Pride uh, things downtown, well, they were very well attended. So there's support. So let's please, please support this ordinance and don't make us look like we're backwards. Thank you. Who else would like to address the council? Mayor? Yes. I had a question. Uh, the speaker said we were voting on Lisa's amendment. I'm not quite sure what we're voting on. Carrie's original motion Carrie's has original amended. Mo that he was opposing Lisa's motion. 
But the this is motion isn't on the floor. So he's supporting this one, is what he said. The original motion, not Lisa's alternative. Correct. Okay. And I want to ask a question, too, of Alderman Janser, if he will be proposing uh, an amendment or an alternative motion. I would like to propose an alternative motion. Okay, thank you. Please. Good evening. I want to thank you uh, for allowing the public to speak to the subject at hand. Thank you, especially Councilman. Woman Olson, and greetings to you. Um, I'm sorry, I'll try to eat the mic a little more. My name is Shane McLaughlin. I'm a resident in Northwest Minot. I'm also a pastor at Bethel Free Lutheran Congregation here in town and serving the living God in the city of Minot. I would like to speak to three things concerning the Human Relations Committee slash commissions and I first want to begin, maybe I'll say four things. First, I find it disturbing because at the last city council meeting, Ms. Olson's uh, amendment was tabled, and now it seems like that is being disregarded and, and trying to supervent by coming up with the ordinance itself. I understand that's a way that you're able to play with things, but it is not proper and correct. Also, I would like to speak in appreciation and support of pastors Dr. Matthew Richards and what he spoke last time, Pastor Greg Demi, and Pastor Jeff Holverson. I was not able to be here at that present at that meeting, um, but I would like to express my support of, of what they had to share and all the others who spoke in accordance to Holy Scripture and those who addressed the, the council last meeting. They spoke correctly and accurately to the matter at hand, and I pray that each of you have felt the weight of their words. The Christian church cannot comply to that which is contrary to Holy Scripture. We cannot be asked to affirm and accept the things that God says no to. Secondly, I would like to dispel any confusion, which is common these days to the phrase of separation of church and state. Just because there is a separation between the church and the state does not mean that there's a separation between the state and God. Each of you as city council members have a divine calling to govern the people of the city, and with that calling comes privileges and responsibilities of which you are and will be held accountable to. If you look around this room, you'll find people standing on different sides of this issue and other issues as well. But the question that you must answer is where does the Lord God stand, and do you have his blessing and his delight? Um, thirdly, the proposed language of the updated committee is very troubling and full of traps and unintended consequences. Ideas have consequences and bad ideas have victims. I encourage you not to take those concerns lightly that the citizens have brought before you. The citizens of this city should never be asked or required to accept and affirm ideas, behaviors, and practices that, as I've said before the council before, have proven harmful to the human body. It is not okay for some of the things and practices that are being proposed in our society today. Along with the prophet Isaiah, Jeremiah, to the people of Judah and the kings of Judah, uh, along with Jonah, who spoke to the Assyrians in Nineveh, and Daniel, who spoke before King Nebuchadnezzar and Darius, pagan nations. I would like to uh, remind you of the Apostle Paul's words when he was speaking before a group such as this that had to deal with all kinds of different things from Acts chapter 17. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. May God bless you. Good evening. My name is Bob Sanderson. I live in Northwest Minot. This is actually my third time living in the city of Minot. 
I wasn't at the other meetings, but I took time to go back and review the tapes of the discussions that have been held before. And I would have a lot of comments I'd like to make, but I know there's not enough time. But one of the things that was said to you was, stay in your lane. I spent about 50 years of my life in human services, and there is no better lane for you to be in than this one. I know that you know how to take care of streets and water and bridges. You have the expertise, you have the equipment, but it takes a different kind of approach to this kind of problem. A snow plow and a backhoe and a shovel are not going to do it. You need to have people who can come together and really talk about this issue from their hearts and their minds to try and find a solution to this. So after listening to that, the only recommendation that we, I would make to this council is to table this ordinance now, appoint a quick commission to look into this issue and you'll probably literally have to get down your knees and pray to find the right kind of people to do this. But it has to be people from both sides of this issue who can come forward with open hearts and open minds and really look at this. In the four, fifth, almost 50 years I spent in human services, I never found one reason to ever dislike gay people. And as a human being, I haven't either. Now, I'm not about to get into a debate with a pastor, but I've read some of those verses and what Jesus said, too. He did not just talk about homosexuality. He talked about adulterers and fornicators and robbers and thieves and a lot of other people. So I think we should take that into account. And there is no one religion that has a right to speak to us about how we feel about this. I'm a Lutheran. I have my right as a Lutheran to feel this way about this. So I ask you again, I'd like to say a lot more. Consider tabling this and having a commission take a look. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Uh, my name is Lori Van Winkle, for the record. I'm a concerned citizen here in Minot and a fellow legislator in District 3. Um, I think that man brings up a good point. There are a lot of other sins and criminal activities. And I think uh, with this motion before us, um, the potential for unintended consequences are far reaching. And if we're gonna start making a carve out for one group of immorality, um, then what comes next? When we stand before you and decide that we really like pedophilia and we really like outbursts of rage and we're going to be Christian rage addicts or whatever you might want to try to identify with, every sin is an identity. It starts somewhere in a person and they have to make a decision whether they're going to follow that through or whether they're going to come, come under the submission of Christ and not do those things. So if we want to raise a generation of murderers, do we then be able to stand up here and, and ask for some sort of protection for these class of individuals? Um, I, think, uh, I think it is very correct that you guys need to stay in your lane and you need to not make car votes for things like this. And uh, also I'd like to say that uh, this legislative session, I think it was very clear that the legislative assembly and the governor were very keen on wanting to stop this agenda in our schools and we passed good bills in HB 1522 and HB 1249 stopping the surgeries and the hormones on the children. I don't think we've seen this as a successful and loving agenda to promote these types of behaviors to children and promote this kind of lifestyle as, as something we should protect and make something that our, our, our city is going to promote. Uh, I know as a Bible-believing Christian and uh, the fact that we are, we are to be governed by moral law and not just make up things as we go, like the man who said, you know, if he feels like it's archaic and outdated, well, it's really not your opinion that you get to change morality or make laws or, or create ordinances for this city. You're supposed to be here to protect every individual and it's supposed to be on the basis of morality and I think it's really an abuse of your power and position to use the home rule charter as an excuse to make 
what we have passed in the legislature worse and say that you're not going to listen to it, you're going to do your own thing. I thought as a home rule charter, we're supposed to start with state law as a minimum. And then because of home rule charter status, we can take that law and make it stronger. So for example, I have an electrician who wanted to, uh, well, the, uh, the electrical uh, inspector actually, wanted to get back the positions of, of having the electrical inspections under home rule charter because they were governed by the state. The state has a lesser requirement for inspections for the city. Well, he wants to do better. Now, if he would have come to me and said, hey, I want to do worse than the city will allow under law, that wouldn't really make sense. And it would be, in my opinion, quite an abuse of power to try to say, I'm gonna usurp the law and do worse than what the state has uh, passed for laws. So I would urge you to um, not create this committee and, and the change the language, but to uh, vote against it. Thank you. Hello, Council. My name is Janet Anderson. I'm speaking to you today to ask that you approve the second reading of the ordinance reinstating the City of Minot's Human Relations Committee with the proposed changes. Your previous observations that this has been a divisive topic is accurate. Yet this division has always existed and many of us experience it regularly. A Human Relations Committee won't solve the issue of bigotry and the lack of compassion, but it's a start. By backtracking on your original vote to approve, you will be making a definite statement to the citizens who feel other and unwelcome. During my time working with you, I would not have believed that this is the statement you want to make or the action that you want to be remembered by. I hope I'm not wrong. I've watched all of these recent city council meetings. I've read the ordinance and I don't recall anything about murderers or pedophilia. While I appreciate the citizen involvement and that you're willing to listen to constituents and weigh their concerns, I have noticed that there are certain facts that are not being considered. First of all, the Human Relations Committee is an advisory committee only and will be overseen by council. There's no legal action being encouraged or pushed despite what some are saying. Next is the idea that labels are bad. Labels aren't inherently bad. These aren't the days of saying, oh, I don't see color. I don't see ability. We should see these things. We need to see and respect and acknowledge the labels that people claim. It's normal to be uncomfortable with differences, but we have to acknowledge this discomfort and move beyond it. The idea that the city shouldn't be concerned with being a welcoming community that makes every effort to accept and respect all of its citizens is confounding. That's the key of this, accept and respect. I, uh, I've heard citizens claim that the city should, uh, should house those who are struggling with poverty and addiction in my past time with the city, that, that you all should help find homes for abandoned animals and you should feed the children. All of these things are noble moral aspirations, but now suddenly people, some of the same people are telling you that it is not the job of the city to promote respect and acceptance for our neighbors. I've also heard more times than I can count that Minot needs a Sam's Club and a Red Lobster. And boy, we sure need more people working at our schools and hospitals and fast food places. Is making news by opposing such a committee going to help lure these businesses and these workers to my nod? Several people have also said that they aren't against any people. They have no hate or ill will toward anyone. But unfortunately, that's not how it works. That's Harassment 101 in the city of Minot sexual harassment policy. Your intention doesn't matter. If you make me feel uncomfortable, you are to blame. If I make you feel uncomfortable, I should apologize. I should not say, oh, it was just a joke. Can't you take a joke? I should apologize and learn not to make that mistake again. 
Further, the claims that this isn't about gay people are really hard to believe. If you took out six words, six words from the proposed changes, there's a very good chance you wouldn't have heard from anyone. Regarding the argument that there are already laws for this, people need to remember that this committee is not making laws. It says so right in the ordinance 2-212D. If anything, they'll be helping enforce these laws by offering a safe place for people to report concerns. Besides, this argument is nonsensical. We already have laws for theft and abuse, yet we have a whole city department that handles that. We have laws about certain drugs and their abuse and the distribution, and yet the mayor's <laughs> the Mayor's Committee on Addiction was one of the most well-received committees in recent history. Finally, as already mentioned, you already approved this. Ask yourself, what made you reconsider? Did you really review the ordinance and have a change of heart? Or was it the calls and emails you received? Will the loudest voices win versus what is actually right for the city? By backtracking on your original vote to approve, you will be making a definite statement to the citizens who feel other and welcome. On this, Juneteenth, I ask you to consider the words of Opal Lee, the grandmother of Juneteenth. Please who wrap in 2021 up your comments. said, we need to be aware that we can do so much more together than apart. Thank you. My name is Claire Gray. Um, I have lived in this community most of my life, and I don't feel safe. I love this community. I raise my children here. I have lots of family, very deep roots. My grandfather was a bailiff at Ward County until he was like 80 years old. My grand, that was my great grandma. My grandfather was a math teacher at Central Campus. I want to stay here. My children want to stay here, but I don't feel safe. I have been told because of the way I am and who I am, I should be made illegal. A travel advisory last week was made about North Dakota. People like me do not come here because it's unsafe. Now, I see this, commi this committee as an opportunity to inform the public, bring people together to help us become better as a community. So please, let's have this committee. Thank you. Mr. Mayor and Council, thanks for hearing us out. I am glad I'm on this side, not on that side of this issue. But I just want to take a minute and talk to you, and even to everybody in the audience here, too. Um, what a surprise, another born-again Christian standing in front of you. And I'd just like to say something, just to clarify, because it's not easy for a Christian to stand up and say, hey, I disagree with someone's behavior. But that's what's happening here and what we're getting at. It's not, I disagree with you that you're alive. Because we believe that every person is brought to life through the very breath and gift of God. Heterosexuals, homosexuals, transgenders, black, white, red, yellow, other, it's a gift. This whole thing is a gift, a wonderful gift. And, and so it is not easy. I, I hope I can do this. I hope this is okay. Anybody here like conflict? Raise your hand. Okay, there's a couple weirdos here. <laughs> okay. Most of us don't, okay? And I did go to school with one of those weirdos. But anyways, um, most of us don't like conflict. We don't want to do this. And we, we can separate the fact that behavior and personhood, value and disvalue, it's a different thing. It's not the same thing. I am a business owner. I work with people who are oriented or have chosen to live a, a different sexual lifestyle than I believe is correct. 
I still can enjoy that person though I disagree with them. And that is how I live because as a believer, as a, as a follower of Jesus, we can love someone even though we disagree with them. And that's okay. And that's the story of the Good Samaritan. That's the story of love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, I'm, I'm going to be done with my sermon here for a second, but I'm going to go to something here. Tolerance has been hijacked in our society. The definition of tolerance is the ability or willingness to tolerate something, in particular the existence of opinions or behavior that one does not necessarily agree with. You know what, guys? We are not going to create... I, I, I hate to be pessimistic. We are not going to create a kumbaya where we all totally agree. And that's okay. This is great. This is the best thing going on the planet. Nobody's killing each other. Everybody's talking. And we're going to weigh in, and you guys are going to have to vote. And I hope you'll vote the way I want you to vote. But if you don't, uh, you're not going to get any recourse from me, except for maybe I'll be here again to press another issue verbally. I love this process. I love this country. I love this state. Um, tolerance is not acceptance of everything. It's the ability to live and let live a little bit. I think this ordinance is bad because eventually we're going to be butting heads with each other's rights. It's going to be, you need to agree or else there's going to be punishment if you don't see it my way. That's not for, for Christians. It's not fair for um, even uh, transgenders or things like that. We need to respect each other and everything, but it, let's just agree to disagree some and realize it's not going to be kumbaya all the time. But this is bad in my opinion, because uh, people are going to get stepped on. One quick note, um, and this is just pointing at a subject. Please be careful what you hitch my not to, because I went to school with a girl who was 80 pounds, and she could look in that mirror and still think she was fat. And this is a harsh point, but I hope it's a practical point. Some people can look themselves in the mirror and say, and say, I'm a girl, when their body doesn't tell them they're a man, or when their body says they're a man. The people who ask us to believe the science that they've come up with and agree with evolution are the same people who are like, hey, don't look at biology and don't look at anatomy when you consider sex and gender. And by the way, those used to mean, like five minutes ago, the same thing. Please, take to consideration that this is going to stomp on a lot of people's rights. I say this ordinance needs to be shot down and Lisa's needs to be supported. I thank you for listening. God bless. I just wanted to say I'm black, I'm white, I'm Christian, I'm Catholic, and I approve of this damn community, so get it rolling. Hello, members of the Minot City Council. My name is Logan Longton, and I'm a local teacher, forester, member of the Minot Planning Commission, and chair of the Source Valley Democratic NPL. I'm here today to express my support for the ordinance by Councilwoman Evans to reenact the city of Minot's Human Relations Committee. Now, I've heard quite a lot of testimony regarding this ordinance from members of the community who would make it seem like this resolution is going to have the city of Minot send police officers to break into our homes and churches and personally indoctrinating our city citizens into supporting the nefarious LGBTQ agenda, whatever that means. But what the ordinance actually does would seem to me be, to be quite benign in nature, as it simply creates a community that only has advisory powers in which the main purpose of is to, quote, promote the acceptance and respect for diversity through educational programs and activities and to discourage all forms of discrimination, unquote. The ordinance then proceeds to list the various things that people could be discriminated against for, most of which have nothing to do at all with the LGBTQ community, including veteran status, national origin, age, or disability. I may have to read it again, but I didn't see anything in there about pedophiles or murderers. So there's many different categories listed, and I'm sure that everyone could say that they're either a member of these groups or they have loved ones who are part of these groups. I think having a part of the city government dedicated to looking out and helping people who may be treated unfairly because of circumstances outside of their control would be a good thing. I have another reason for supporting this resolution, resolution, namely that diversity is an asset and should be treated as such. Now, I'm a straight white male, which naturally means that there is nothing but a hard lump of coal where my heart should be. Arguments about compassion, fairness, and equality shouldn't mean anything to me. All my tastes and interests are already catered, catered to. I feel safe anywhere I go in town. 
and I never felt like I was discriminated against for anything outside of my own control. Yet I believe that this ordinance would still benefit even people like me who have never felt discriminated against because diversity is an asset. Minot is an interesting and exciting community to live in because of its diversity. This town wouldn't be nearly as nice to live in without events like Juneteenth, the Pride Festivals, the Spring Honor Dance and Pow Wow, or without all the great minority-owned businesses and restaurants that Minot is home to. I don't want to just eat hamburgers and lefsa every day. I'm grateful, even as a straight white male, that we live in a diverse community because of the enrichment it brings to me and everyone else who calls Minot home. If establishing a human relations committee helps people feel safe and welcome in Minot even a little bit more, then it would be worth it. Finally, I would just like to say that I've heard testimony from a lot of spiritual leaders who claim to speak on behalf of the Christian community of Minot. Now, I'm not a pastor or anything like that, nor do I even go to church as often as I would like to admit, but I do know my Gospels. And one of the most important lessons that they teach me is that all things whatsoever I would that men should do to me, I should do even so to them. And I think we should all strive to act up to that instruction. So I encourage you to vote yes on Councilman Woman's, Councilwoman Evans's resolution. Thank you. My name is Marlo Grubb. I live and work in Southwest Minot. Mine will be really short. We live in amazing days. The Lord declared he doesn't like people that sit on the fence, get on one side or the other. Don't sit on the fence. And this issue that is at place here is a dividing line. You have to choose one side or the other. There is an inability to sit on the fence when this issue is presented. I like to call that the refiner's fire, which makes pure gold. You're in a tight spot. You agree with one side and you become the enemy of the other. So politically, you need to think about what side of the line is going to be the victor. Which political fire will be cleansing? Which political fire will be torment? The conservative Christian base of this country is the majority. Witness the amazing shutdown of Budweiser as evidence of what I'm talking about. So, it, it again, it's your choice. That's the pain of life that I, I call it the pain of choice. We have to deal with the choices that we make. And I know that your choices aren't easy because politics is a terrible, terrible game. But that is what it is. The conservative people of this country are the majority. And that should be weighing on you heavily with what decisions you make. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Tim Bagwell. And I have three boys that I've raised here in Minot, North Dakota. And... I always tell people it's a great place to raise children. And I still believe that. And I think what's happening is <clears throat> in the world today, people are looking for that. They're looking for a place that they can raise a family and live the American dream. Uh, I think Minot provides that in a lot of ways. Um, I agree with some of the sentiments that I've heard. I know the decisions that you have to make are not easy. Um, and it is very difficult. And you have to weigh a lot of things. If you've lived in Minot or in any area of North Dakota, I don't have to describe what a slippery slope is. I can try it again. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe this is one of those slippery slopes. And I think caution should be at the forefront. I also want to thank every person that's gotten up here and. Uh, spoke before me. It does take uh, a great amount of courage to speak for what you believe in, uh, regardless of what side of the issue you stand on. But I would also say that for those that um, feel they have a fear to live here, I'm not quite sure I understand that, where we just had a, a celebration of pride and there were no major riots or fights or 
arrests that I'm aware of. And there are countries in the world where if it's rumored that somebody lives a different lifestyle, they're thrown off of a rooftop. We're not like that. We're not going to be like that. And I think what most people here want to see is uh, for those things that maybe appear to be archaic to continue because this is a great, a great place to raise children. It is a great place to have a family. And as some of my brothers in Christ have spoken about the Bible, there's some archaic terms in there too. But I don't think any of us want to change and go back to uh, revising the Ten Commandments, making it okay and reversing the laws there. In fact, our laws in this nation came from those commandments. And we're not asking, again, to force our beliefs on anybody else, but we're asking to uh, have our beliefs considered and weighed, and that's your job. But I, my prayer is that you take that job seriously, as, as I believe you are, and pray and consider the decisions that you have to make for all of the families that it will affect. Thank you. Hello, I'm Christina Wolf. Um, I actually didn't prepare anything for tonight. I didn't think we we're going to have any discussion, but I just have a few questions for you guys. Um, why was the original committee for this ordinance, the original ordinance, why was it disbanded? Like, there was one. It was decades ago. Does anybody know? Nobody knows. Okay. Um, and is there a reason why this was brought to the forefront at this point, like this human relations committee? Um, maybe that can be considered when you're thinking about what we're, what we're doing here. Um, I think the, when I first read the, um, ordinance, the words perceived discrimination really concerned me as a citizen and, um, because anybody can perceive anything as, as anything. And, um, I just think that this is a waste of taxpayer money and time if there was no specific reason that it was brought to the forefront. And I ask that you do not approve of it and get rid of the original ordinance as well if that's still hanging in there for some reason, even though it wasn't being utilized for years and years. Okay, if there's no further comment, I will uh, open it up for discussion from the council. Oh, we've got one more. Hi, I'll try and make it quick. <laughs> I really appreciate all of your patience and listening to everybody. Um, my name is Ashley LaFors. Um, I just wanted to come up here and my family recently went through a horrible horrible experience. We lost one of our children to suicide in September of 2022. Our child was transgender questioning. A lot of what I'm hearing here today is exactly the reason why we need a human relations committee. I'm hearing a lot of people say, I'm not sure why people don't feel comfortable and might not. I'm hearing a lot of people say, I'm afraid of ideas. I'm hearing a lot of people say, what's wrong with my not? And this is exactly the reason why we need a human relations committee, because that those perceived questions, those interpretations of what is and is not okay need to be discussed, because what I feel is okay and what my child felt was okay may not be what somebody else does. And all those voices need to be heard. Um, my family, we come from many, many marginalized groups uh, who live in Minot, veterans, LGBTQ, mental health questions, <laughs> problems, um, autism, special needs. All of these things are things that this Human Relations Committee will address. And it's, again, it's not somebody who's going to dictate laws. 
it's a committee that's going to be there to bring up why this group doesn't feel okay, why this group feels like they are okay, and to hopefully give you all some perspective on those marginalized groups and why they do or do not feel the way they do. So thank you for your time. Thank you for listening to everybody. Just, you have a very hard job. <laughs> thank you. Um, at this time, I'll open it up for discussion uh, on the dais with uh, council members. Mark. Mr. Mayor, I would like to make a motion to amend the ordinance as we have it in front of us um, to uh, text that I am passing out. I'm going to give you two things. Um, one is the um, ordinance, uh, and the other is the um, tracking of the of the changes so that so that you have both of those um, this this has been a um, a, a challenging um, topic um, I think I'm certainly in favor of having a human relations committee because Indeed, if there are folks who don't feel comfortable in the community or who um, find themselves in situations where we could change something and it would improve their lives. Um, for example, a number of years ago. Excuse um, me one second. I hate to interrupt, Mark, but do we have, we have an amendment? Do we need a second for that? I'll second. Okay, we've got a second. Okay. Now we can move okay, on thanks. to discussion. Sorry about that, Mark. Uh, it, it, where a number of years ago, uh, a citizen came and said, hey, I, I'm in a wheelchair 100% um, of the time, and after 6 o'clock at night, there's no transportation in this town for me. I can't get home. I can't go any place. Um, I'm stuck. And we were able to address that. You know, it was something that, something that the city council could do. So... I, I'm in favor of having a place, and, and this is from the old ordinance, which said um, uh, it was to promoting communications between all parties leading to equal opportunity and treatment for all persons. I don't think anybody can argue with that. And I think there should be a safe space for voices to be heard where they don't have to be afraid to, to talk to us. What, one of my friends who, uh, since we're talking labels, is a black man and a gay person, said, it's good if you have some place where people can speak because things sometimes are like a dog whistle. They just aren't heard. And I think we all have some of that issue. So um, what I did uh, in, in uh, sitting down with our city attorney was to go through uh, the draft of the um, ordinance that we had and make a number of changes, um, tightened up, I guess I would say, the language and made this uh, a bit more focused. And um, so I submit that as an amendment to, uh, to get this thing passed. Going, Alderman Jander? No. Okay, I was just bringing up to uh, Mayor Ross just so that everyone in the room knows with this amendment or any amendment to this, if it gets voted on and passes, even though this revision's only seen one reading, 
it would still pass because the ordinance is voted on twice. So I just want everyone in the room to know, all of the councilmen and women to know, if anything is voted on with revisions to this ordinance, it will still pass on second reading. I have. Carrie. <clears throat> Make no mistake that supporting the status quo or the amendment offered by Alderman Janser sends a clear message to our community that we are unwilling to acknowledge or even say out loud or write down the diversities that exist in Minot. We are unwilling to provide the form for a committee that educates and promotes respect for diversity. We are unwilling to recognize that 2023 Minot is different than it was in 1976. Some have attempted to rationalize their lack of support for an updated committee, but willful ignorance and intolerance does not have nuances. We have spent months being misled about what this ordinance does. It creates a law against discrimination. It mutilates children. It contradicts the Christian Bible. To be clear, <coughs> this ordinance does none of those things. This committee will work to educate all of us about the realities and lives of individuals in our city with the goal of helping us work for respect and understanding of people like Kelly and Sam, who have decided to not have another child because Kelly is afraid she will be demoted at work if she is pregnant again. Tiffany, who is philosophically opposed to vaccinating her children. Jennifer, who survived a house fire that left her face disfigured. Zachary, who receives social assistance and food stamps. Jeanette, who tested positive for the BRCA2 gene variation known to increase likelihood of getting breast cancer and is nervous about being kicked out of her health insurance plan. Doug, who pled guilty and served his sentence for a felony drug charge more than 10 years ago and cannot get a job. Lily and Jonathan, who are experiencing homelessness. Okaro, a Nigerian who enlisted in the United States Air Force as a path to acquire his citizenship. Morgan, an 83-year-old widow who needs some help, but desperately wants to stay in the home that he and his wife raised their three children in, but people think he is too old. Tracy, who is hard of hearing and has difficulty at city council meetings hearing us. Brock, who is paralyzed in a car accident and has difficulty navigating our snow-covered sidewalks in the winter. And yes, Levi, who is an openly gay member of the United States Air Force and struggles to feel like he is safe and welcome in Minot. And no, this committee cannot make all of this better or even change hearts and minds, but it can provide the form for recognizing the realities of people different from us. It can foster a dialogue and help advise city council on how we can work to ensure Minot is a city for everyone, not just people like us. While some people long for the days when Minot was homogeneous and monolithic, I choose to acknowledge that 2023 Minot is filled with a beautiful mosaic of people. In 6% of Minot homes, a language other than English is spoken. 7% of our city is Hispanic. 48% of our city are over the age of 65, and nearly 5% of Minot identifies as black. As an elected official, I feel compelled to do everything I can to make the city we all love a place for all of us to live, to work, and to be our authentic selves. The leadership at Minot Air Force Base has intentionally embraced the Air Force's diversities. Today, they are marking Juneteenth activities in Oak Park. A few weeks ago, Colonels Holdley and McGee signed a proclamation marking the start of LGBTQ plus Pride Month, and here we are. On April 17th, this governing body with a seven to zero vote supported this ordinance. Since then, we have experienced a disruptive trend. As we discussed at our retreat that same month, a disruptive trend is inevitable. But what is not inevitable is our response to this trend. Those responses are intentional. Tonight will be our intentional response to a disruptive trend. If this ordinance fails, our next step as a governing body should be revoking our Magic City aspiration of safe and welcoming, an aspiration that we all unanimously agreed to in 2021 and 2023. 
Our actions are tonight are the test of whether as leaders we implement our aspiration that states, quote, Minot is a caring community where people feel safe and engaged with opportunities to celebrate our histories and diverse identities. Our actions are a test of whether we want to work to understand or respect the realities of Zachary, Jennifer, and Levi. The choice is ours. Any other comments? Questions? Lisa. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I think that there is a little bit of a misunderstanding, um, maybe from some of the people that have been either in attendance at our meetings or watching online, that we have opposing motions. We don't have opposing motions. The motions that have been made have both been in an attempt to have a committee to acknowledge the diversity within our community, to celebrate the diversity, to make mine itself and welcome, or safe and welcoming. The only thing that was different was how the wording was going to look. One was already pre-described. One was going to give a committee the opportunity to write it themselves and bring it back to us. That was the only difference. Um, so the path to the, the path was going to the same location. It was just how we were gonna get there. In my mind, giving the power to the people, to that committee, seemed like it made the most sense. It doesn't seem like that, that is necessarily what this audience wants. And so in it, if we are going to already write the ordinance, I feel much more comfortable with Alderman Janser's proposal, which would include all of our citizens. Anything, Steve? Steve? Thank you. Um, I was an original supporter and seconded Carrie's motion. And I strongly believe in the importance of recognizing diversity and in creating this committee. I missed a meeting because we were traveling. And I came back and I listened to the video and audio of that meeting and I was really surprised. I was shocked by the vehemence of the opposition to this motion. It was something I didn't anticipate. Quite frankly, this is more rancor than I've seen in my 14 years on the council. I think this is equal with the family dining, smoke-free family dining ordinance some 20 years ago, and it probably is equal to, if not more than, uh, when we tried to take precautions to save people's lives during COVID. And I was really taken aback by that. I've also listened to testimony uh, from the public at subsequent meetings, and some of the points that have been made I disagree with. I don't think they're valid, but they're points that people believe and uh, express. Um, and I think in some ways the original motion was an overreach in the sense that we wanted to celebrate and embrace diversity. I've come to the conclusion that I'm not sure that's a proper role for municipal government to do. I think it's a proper role to uh, require certain behavior or to achieve certain educational functions. But getting people to feel something, I think maybe beyond what we can legitimately or should legitimately do. Um, Acceptance to some people, accepting diversity means approval. When I looked it up in the dictionary, that is indeed one of the definitions. And it seems like a fair number of people feel that words like that, like accepting diversity or rec even recognizing it, are really basically a thumb in their eye. And as a policymaker, I don't want to continue down a path where a significant number of people feel we're putting a thumb in their eye, even if I think the underlying idea is a good one. I guess to be very candid, I'll always certainly support, continue to support um, the committee and will speak in favor of in just a few minutes if the mayor allows me a little bit of extra time. Uh, I am concerned that the wording as originally proposed is needlessly divisive um, and I think it actually may be counterproductive. Uh, I would like us to start the conversation. For me the priority is to start talking about these things, not to present, pretend they don't exist or pretend that everything is peachy keen. Respectfully it's not and we need to face that as a community. But I think the way we start that is by gradually beginning the conversation and not jumping ahead of ourselves. And unfortunately, I think that the earlier specification of protected groups or categories or characteristics does that. Again, it's hard for me to understand, but um, again, a significant number of people feel very, very upset about that. Uh, and I think Mark's motion is, is, a, is a reasonable way around that conflict. Um, I think by tweaking some of the wording, um, I think that hopefully should make it more palatable to more people. 
Uh, politics is basically the art of the possible. And for me, the priority is for us to move toward a more accepting and welcoming and tolerant community. Um, and getting the committee started, getting it to work is, is the primary thing for me. Um, some people have raised the issue of what's your ultimate goal. People have talked about different agendas. My agenda is to have a more welcoming and accepting community. My agenda also would be, frankly, to um, provide specific protections for citizens in terms of their views, their practices, their religions, whatever. Um, and I would one of the things I would like this committee, assuming it is uh, recreated, would be to consider that, to consider a very strong ordinance protecting everyone's rights. The second thing I would want to see it consider is very strong protections for our employees. Um, I don't know what laws protect which people for which behaviors or characteristics, but I want to make sure that our employees are treated with respect and dignity and that there's no discrimination of any sort against them or in terms of how the city treats its citizens. A broader human rights ordinance I, I think probably would be a good idea and I think should be considered, but I think that would be premature at this time. And similarly, I think the specification of certain groups also would be premature. I'd like the committee to go to work to start the dialogue, because I think that's, that's what really needs to happen. Um, so my agenda is to work toward a more tolerant, more accepting community, and I think the way to do that is to create, re create this committee, recreate it, and then give it some time to work, give it some time for people to talk, to think about alternatives, to see if there are possible compromises. Maybe there will be, maybe there won't, um, but I think we need to embark on that effort. Again, because I'm very concerned about the conflict and rancor that has arisen here, and I don't know that plowing ahead um, will make things better. Um, I think, as Mark said last time, it really is about hearts and minds. And the way I see people uh, polarized and uh, in division, um, I think that's going to be a very difficult struggle. So I think some judicious changes um, would help reduce some of that and increase the, the probability of a successful outcome. So I'm going to continue to support the creation of this committee, but I'm also going to support some modifications in the way that um, the resolution is worded, because I think that's more likely to lead the, to the outcome that's very important to me. Scott? All right, I have sat through all of these weeks of, of listening to testimony and getting emails and talking to people, and, you know, it, it, I, uh, Steve, I'm the new guy here, so I, I don't have, you know, smoking bans to compare this to, but this is, is definitely not what I was expecting when I got elected to see this issue come to the table. And saying that, the hyperbole and political theater around this has been spectacular. There are so many things that has been said by people that is absolutely not in this bill. There's nothing going to shove anything down anybody's throat in this bill. There's nothing that's going to override state-led laws in this bill. There's nothing that's going to make anybody do something that's against their religious beliefs. In fact, I believe it would work to protect religious beliefs. I, I cannot believe... You know, human rights aren't pie. If somebody gets it, it doesn't take anything away from me. And I'm, I'm so tired of this argument. And when does it stop? These, these movements that we've heard, this, this again, political theater and hyperbole that we saw, are being pushed by national forces. They're not about things that are happening on the streets of Minot. They're not about the things that are happening here. They're things that are being pushed by others, by people that want to come into Minot that say, you know what's not screwed up enough? Minot, North Dakota. So let's go into the streets of Minot. Let's make it all messy. And let's talk about all these things. And, and, about mutilating children and about all that kind of stuff. That's not what this bill does. And, and at some point, when does it stop? Well, maybe it stops here. Mark, I appreciate your, your ordinance and your, your proposed changes to this. I, I struggle a lot with, with taking off um, any of the, this, the marginalized persons that were talked about in it. Because the original ordinance from 1976 listed the marginalized people that were talked about at that time. Since that point, we've added in people with disabilities when the Americans with Disabilities Act was signed about 33 years ago. We've added in protections for um, multiple other classes. We've came a long way as far as, as gender roles in the workplace and, and uh, you know, appearance. Uh, Carrie talked about uh, helping people who want to 
return to the workforce after felonies. And, and we've just worked hard to make this a, a more welcoming world in which we live. And I, I worry about ripping it all away and saying, well, let's just help everybody because not everybody is necessarily having these issues. I think that there's a value in saying, you know what, we recognize the fact that there are marginalized people in our community. We recognize, and we heard of so many. I, I just want to go back to an example. I ran for city council because I wanted to make mine out a more livable community. During the, the public testimony around this, we had a young airman who came up who talked about being a transgender man. And somebody in the back of the room yelled out, why don't you just move? That is shameful behavior. Absolutely shameful. We need people that live in this community. We could use a few thousand more people moving to our community who, if you want to come to my community, if you want to you know, follow the laws and, and work hard, you are my brother. And I don't care which of these, these um, labels you come under. You are my brother. You are my sister. And, and I want people to be welcomed in this community. And I think that that starts with what this bill really is, or what this ordinance really is, which is about creating conversation. Because we need to hear from people who, who feel marginalized and just listen. I, I had a conversation by email with a friend of mine who is on the um, Bismarck Human Relations Commission and kind of looked into what they're doing. And they're having conversations around, hey, what is it like to live in Bismarck when you're a, a person of color? or people from the, a person from the LGBTQIA community, or when you're a Muslim, or when you've moved here from another country, or when you've moved here from another part of the state. Let's have conversations. Let's talk about what that's like. There's, there's no, this, this committee, this ordinance is only advisory so that people can come forward and say, hey, here's my experiences. And us as a city council can take that into play as we choose. But I don't know. I, Mark, I, I like a lot, I, you know, I agree with the conversation that's been had earlier. Maybe we can tweak a word here. Maybe we can tweak a word there. Maybe it's best to be left up to the committee to do that. But I also believe we're the people that were, were voted on by the people. And I believe that we can, we can monkey around with some of the words, but we have to recognize the fact that there are marginalized people in this community. We have to name them. And that's where we start. Any final comment? Paul? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm not going to support Mark's motion. I'm not going to support Carrie's. I'm not going to support Lisa's. Um, this has actually been a really, really tough thing to sit through all of this garbage on both sides of the issue. Because yeah, it is. It's just dumb. It's so dumb that this is what we're, this is what fills a dais, this is what fills the city council chambers. It's embarrassing for us as citizens, it's embarrassing me for as a council member that this is what brings people out. Um, the only motion I would support, and maybe I'll make it as an alternative if, if, if these others fail, um, to reenact the Human Relations Committee, I would like to see Alderman, uh, Alderwoman Olson and Alderwoman Evans as co-chairs. I'd like the remaining members to be appointed by the city council um, and the first directive to be to make any changes to the language if deemed necessary. Um, I'm the anecdote guy. I'm, I'm the one who relays stuff from my life and how it works and how it translates into to, 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 to this job. Um, every once in a while, I have an idea like older woman Ev Evans had, and, and like that, like she did. She presented it to us as a group, and I'll, I'll stop there and I'll, I'll relay it to my life. I present white ideas to my wife every once in a while. You know what she does? Tells me how dumb. Well, I shouldn't say that. She's probably watching. So she tells me how how that needs how she's not a fan of it. She doesn't support my idea. And then you know what happens? I get mad, and we don't talk for a little while, and then we have some more uncomfortable conversations, and we don't talk for an unpredetermined amount of time, and then then finally we come back around. And I explained my idea because clearly she just didn't understand what I was saying, right? She just didn't get it. It's a great idea. She just didn't get it. But then we're able to take a step away and come back, and we have some civil conversations. And like um, Alderman Burlingame said, you know, 
this is this this is to start conversations and i don't think we've had the conversations yet we've had a lot of uncomfortable conversations that's clear that is very clear on both sides i lost my father last a couple weeks ago now and i had more than condolences for my late father I had emails about this stuff on both sides of the aisle. I had calls, I had texts. Someone stopped me at my father's funeral to talk about this. How embarrassing of a community can we be that this is what brings us out and this is how we handle issues. Reenact the committee. Alderwoman Olson and Evans had the first motions on this. They can co-chair it. Bob Sanders, if you want to be on the committee, if you're still here, you're my vote. Have some uncomfortable conversations. Get pinned in a room with each other and let's hash it out. Let's work together. Let's come together and let's, let's be curious and not judgmental. I'm just really embarrassed. I'm really, really embarrassed. And some of us have had great comments and some of us have been constructive. But some of it's just been, this is how we're going to hash it out. It's not my job. It's not anybody's job up here to determine what the language is in there. It says, that's the citizens of Minot. I will only support a motion to where we reenact this committee and get a recommendation, an advisory committee, and get a recommendation from that committee on what that language says. And it should be appointed from, I believe, the members that sit up here. Because we are a diverse council, and I'm proud of that. I'm very proud of the people that I sit up here with, each and every one of you. But I won't support any motion that's been put forward. I can't at this point. It's, it's become too much of a gong show uh, to steal a, a word from my wife's uh, dialect. But um, again, we're, we're not at the constructive conversation point yet. We're at, the de uh, we're at the destructive conversation point. And that's very clear. That is very clear. We need to put our differences aside, talk face to face. When someone says, I don't understand what it's like to live in a community where you don't feel safe, let's have a conversation with that person and let's ask, ask them why. And then the vice versa. Let's ask why it is a safe community and why we should be safe here. We did have a Pride event and there were no arrests. There were no, no, nothing that I heard of. But if someone tells me they don't feel safe, then I'm going to listen to them and I want to hear them out. And I think that's what we need to do. So I won't support any motion that doesn't include Older Woman Olson and Older Woman Evans as co-chairs. The remaining members to be, uh, seven members to be uh, picked by this council and uh, the first directive to be, uh, um, to offer recommendations uh, on any language changes if deemed necessary. And you know what, great, we've got two drafts that Alderman Janser, Alderwoman Olson put together for us to uh, work, use as a working draft and maybe take the best of both. So that's where I'm at. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, council members. Um, this is, uh, you know, I've been taking notes and for the last month you kind of get to that point to where you're either driving in the car or sitting in your backyard and you're trying to think of, uh, you know, what exactly you're going to say and, and what are you going to support. And, and all along I said um, that I would support uh, reinstating the original committee, appointing that and having the changes come from the committee themselves and having members of the council appoint those members of that committee. And um, I was unaware that uh, Alderman Janser was going to put an amendment together. And um, I was unaware of Alderman Pittner putting his amendment together. And uh, you know, it, it, it speaks volumes about, you know, I'm going back and forth. What I, you know, okay, Mark, you know, I kind of like that. You know, Paul, I mean, it, it, it's very close to what I wanted to support or that I would support. And through all of this, and it, and it really hasn't been a struggle because it really comes down for me, it comes down to what's in my heart. And I'm going to vote and I'm going to speak what's in my heart because nobody can... Nobody can turn that around because it's my heart. I, um, you know, by voting against Alderman Janser's amendment, voting against uh, Alderwoman Evans' uh, uh, ordinance, 
on the second reading. If you think a vote against that makes me uh, against every one of those groups listed, then you don't know me. And I dare say that you will not find a more welcoming person in the city of Minot than Tom Roth. And I'll put that up against anyone. I have turned away no one from any meeting. So I can't legislate feelings. I can't legislate perceptions. But I can lead by example. And that's where I'm at. So, you know, talk about, and I'm, I'm, you know, it's not a, it wasn't a Hail Mary pass, but it was a, it, it was a good one for me, um, Alderman Pittner, and, and uh, I'm going to follow suit. I, I, I just can't support Alderman Jancers. I can't support Alderwoman, Alderwoman uh, Evans. Uh, but I can support bringing a group of minded people together, that, together to start the conversation and having that committee equally appointed by members of the council to where we start the conversation. Do I know what it's like to be trans or gay in the city of Minot? Absolutely not. But I've done my part to reach out and ask, what is it like? And I will continue to do so. I don't want people, this is, my, this is my city. I was born and raised here. And you've heard it time and time again. I love the city of Minot. And I will always love the city of Minot. And I will do what I can to make it the most welcome community in this country. But I also put my name in the hat for mayor with the saying of together we can. On 2,000 yard signs, together we can, and together we will, but it's got to be together, and it's got to represent the city of Minot. So I'm going to vote against yours, Amendment Mark, and I will vote against your second reading, Kerry, but I will support reestablishing the original committee and making Lisa. Uh, Councilwoman Olson and Councilwoman Evans, co-chairs of that, and building something that is even stronger. That's what you get when you get when you get 14 sets or seven sets of eyes looking at one problem. You get a good. You, you can have a good solid solution. But just imagine getting more people on that committee together, having that conversation, and seeing if there is an issue, seeing if there is a problem, but have that conversation. Not standing in two groups after the council meeting outside. Let's have those groups come together. Let's have them come together in this room and start that conversation and that education and be open about it. That's where I stand. So, on the amendment, as it stands, call the roll. Janser? Yes. Olson? No. Pittner? No. Roger Gula? Yes. Ross? No. Erling Game? Yeah, no, no, sorry. Evans? No. Motion fails on the amendment. Moving back to the original motion um, as presented, call the roll. I think this would be for the um, approval of second reading. Evans? Yes. Dancer? No. Olson? No. Pittner? No. Roger Gula? No. Ross? No. Berlin game? Yes. Motion fails. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Alderman Pittner. I believe now would be an appropriate time. I'd live, move to uh, reenact the Human Relations Committee with Alderwoman Olson and Alderwoman Evans to co chair the committee with the remaining seven uh, members to be appointed by each member of the council. And uh, the first uh, order of business to be uh, given to the committee is to update the language of the ordinance if any changes are deemed necessary by the committee. Uh, city attorney, step. Uh, Alderman Pittner and Mayor Ross, underneath the current ordinance, it states that the Human Relations Committee membership shall not exceed 20. Primary members shall be appointed by the mayor for a three-year term with approximately one-third being appointed each year 
Six initial appointments shall be for one year, seven for two years, seven for three years. The city manager shall be an advisory member, and each primary member shall select one alternate member to serve on the commission. Um, I believe your motion is to appoint seven members to the committee, Alderman Pittner. With that knowledge, do you want to make an amendment to your motion? Do you want me to include that the committee is to be comprised of seven members? So the current ordinance says membership shall not exceed 20. I don't want that many. Seven doesn't exceed 20, so we should be okay, right? Okay, so you want seven members? Or it'd be nine total. Nine, seven members, and then co-chair the Olson and co-chair Evans. And then is the city manager on there also? Advisory. An advisory member. I'll second that motion. Are you in a good spot, Steph? And just to confirm, you want them appointed by the city council and not the mayor? Correct. Okay. And then with approximately one third being appointed each year of the seven members? Correct. Okay. We have a motion and a second uh, discussion. Paul. Um, I'm gonna try to get through this here. Um, if you knew Okay, if you knew my dad, you didn't think of him as a really open person. He was about as hardworking, worked on the railroad for 50 years. One of my vivid memories of my dad, he had sandpaper for hands. He'd come home and mom would tell us one of us was sick. And he'd take Vicks Vapor Rub and he'd wrap a towel around our neck and put a safety pin in it. And he'd come in and he'd rub our, rub our, rub our chest. And you knew, you, you knew he was home because it was like somebody's sand, rubbing sandpaper on your, on your chest. Um, he was a guy who, who you didn't think of as an open-minded person. You didn't think of as a progressive person. You just didn't. He was 71 years old. He was born and raised in Minot. <clears throat> but at his celebration of life, I saw people of all colors and all creeds get up and talk about that man and how much he loved, and he never turns you away. He didn't give a crap if you were black or white or gay or lesbian or trans. He could give a crap less. He just loved. Sometimes he loved with a backhand. Sometimes he loved with a belt. Sometimes he loved with a hug and a kiss. But that man loved, okay? And I think this committee can put us on a track to just loving a little bit. And, and that's what I hope comes from this. If anything, I just hope that I, we could love just a fraction of the, man, the amount that that man did. So I, I, I thank the council for going through this process. I thank the citizens for coming out and being a part of this. And I look forward to seeing you all at um, the budget meetings and for this room to be as full then as it is now. So... Um, I thank you for everybody's work on this. I thank everybody for sitting and getting up and speaking. It's not easy. Um, but I'll conclude my comments with that. Thank you. Any other comments? Scott? So politics is often about compromise, and, and sometimes it's, it's, it's not the bill we all want or the legislation we all want, but it's a legislation that maybe we can live with. And I seconded this because I agree with Paul on, on many things, and including this, that... We can continue, we can re-up the committee, maybe tweak it a little bit, come back with some suggestions, and, and show that we are a welcoming community. I, I trust the, the represent, representatives that each of us appoint to the committee. I trust the co-chairs to, to work through this as, as, a, as a team and come through with something. So I, uh, again, maybe it's not exactly what I wanted, it does say the Human Relations Commission does exist in 2023 in Minot. It says that we're working. It says that we're trying to get better, and I think there's a huge amount of value in that. Steve. I want to second what Scott just said. Um, as I said before, politics is the art of the possible. Um, this doesn't represent what I would have wished for, um, but I think it's the best that's uh, achievable under the circumstances, and it's a reasonable compromise. Um, in life, we 
do what we can, we get what we can. And I think this is a significant accomplishment. Again, for me, the priority is to get us talking as a community about these issues, get us trying to build greater understanding and work toward that kind of unity and, and community spirit that the mayor and Paul have talked about. So although I did not originally um, favor this, um, I will favor it now because I think it's the best that we can accomplish and the best, the uh, uh, perfect should never be the enemy of the good. And I think this is good enough for me at this point. Any other comments? Carrie. So, oh, thanks, Paul. I mean, this is a good, I'm going to support this, but Steve, good enough and compromise should never be what marginalized groups have to do. And we've had to compromise and, and, just take good enough scraps for decades, whether we're African American, whether we're indigenous, whether we're women. And so yes, I will support this, and yes, I will continue fighting like hell for these people that we've taken out of our ordinances. But I want to remind you, we are compromising, and you're asking marginalized people to compromise and take Good enough. Any other comments? I feel a need to respond to that. Um, I've worked with marginalized people my whole career, many different kinds of marginalized groups, and I'm not asking those people, and I haven't worked with those people, to accept uh, mistreatment or inappropriate treatment. Um, there's a difference between an individual process and what we do as clinicians or advocates and what we do as public servants. Uh, my comment was that in the political reality of this community at this point in time, this is the best I think we can accomplish. Do I think that's good enough? No, but that's the reality that I think I'm facing and we're facing at this point. So I don't want my comments to be in any way misinterpreted as uh, uh, colluding with uh, victims, uh, colluding with uh, discrimination or colluding with mistreatment of people. Uh, and if it had come to it, I've had several stories that I was gonna tell. Uh, about people I've worked with, and including myself, who have been victims of significant discrimination. And when it comes time to talking to the committee, I will, I will relay those stories, because I think they are powerful stories, equally powerful as others that have been, have been spoken. And I, I do want to speak for people I've worked with and known um, who have suffered. And I, I want to give a voice to, to, their, uh, to their pleas and, and to their, the injustices they've suffered. So I by no means uh, excuse that, um, but I'm looking at it from the perspective of what we can accomplish in, in a, a civic environment. Um, so I'd be very clear about that. I, I certainly empathize with and do the best I can to help people who have been mistreated. Um, but again, I think there are realities out there we may not like, but at some level we need to acknowledge, maybe not accept, but acknowledge at least. Lisa. Yeah, thank you. Just briefly, um, in April, we sat in a city council retreat, and the facilitator gave us a statement that has stuck with me. And uh, when she was trying to pull together all of our thoughts, she said she didn't want anyone to compromise, but she wanted collaboration, and they're very different things. Compromise means that someone gives something up. Collaboration means that every voice is heard. I think every voice has been heard, and I think that that's how this committee will move forward, is in collaboration. Nothing further, please call the roll. Okay, the council will be voting on the motion by Alderman Pittner to reenact the Human Relations Committee with co-chairs Alderwoman Olson and Alderwoman Evans. The remaining seven members will be appointed by council and the first order of business of the committee will be to advise the city council on any ordinance changes. Pittner? Yes. Pajagula? Yes. Ross? Yes. Burlingame? Yes. Evans? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson. Yes. Motion passes. Moving along on the agenda, we'll be moving to um, item 7.2, and that's the city manager's contract. What are the wishes of the council? I would move approval, Mr. Mayor. Got a motion by Lisa to approve. Second. Second by Mark. Is there any discussion? No discussion, please call the roll. Olson? Yes. Pittner? Yes. Pajagula? Yes. Ross? Yes. Burlingame? Yes. Evans? Yes. Janser? Yes. Congratulations. 
Moving on to 7.3 contract with, I can't pronounce it, Dorm, Dormacaba? Dormacaba. Dormaca for the exit lane upgrades. What are the wishes of the council? So moved. I got, got a motion by Mark, second by Paul. Is there any discussion? I can just make a comment real quick. Go ahead. I just want to comment on this and thank the airport staff originally when we were looking at this with some of the challenges we've had at the airport. We were looking at almost a $700,000 price tag. So being able to resolve this issue at less than 100000 is uh, great work by the staff in coming up with this solution. And um, um, so again, just thank you to the staff for the hard work on this. Thank you, Harold, for those comments. Any further discussion? If not, please call the roll. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Pittner? Yes. Podragula? Yes. Ross? Yes. Burlingame? Yes. Evans? Yes. Moving on to item eight is uh, personal appearances. Now is the time if you would like to address the council on any topic. Now is your opportunity. If not, we will move on to item nine. That's miscellaneous and discussion items. 9.1 community contribution presentations for budgeting purposes. First on the agenda uh, is the Minot Commission on Aging. Good evening. Uh, my name is Roger Reich. I'm the executive director for Minot Commission on Aging. Can you pull the mic down clo or put it close? Up or down? I, I don't know how, but. Hello. <laughs> I Hello. think there's buttons on the side, Roger. You can lift it up. No one on the side, that's the top. Jeez, Roger. <laughs> oh, you have, you oh. have. There's something that's cool. Okay. You're the tall man. You know what? Do you want me to do this for you? <laughs> I was born in 1960. They, we didn't have things like that. <laughs> but this man, what he wants. <laughs> it's good to see you, Roger. I'm glad I could give you a hard time before you even started. So, uh, um, you guys want to hear a joke first? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is it a dad joke? Why did the dinosaur Why did the dinosaur cross the road? Chickens weren't uh, alive yet. <laughs> Chickens weren't alive yet. Oh. All right. That's a dad joke. <laughs> well, I I just thought I'd lighten up the crowd a little bit for you guys. I saw a lot of people left because I was speaking, so I was like, "Yeah." <laughs> anyway, uh I know that you've all gotten our, our package, what we were asking for. We were asking for $159,000 to help with our um, senior programs at Minot Commission on Aging. We use that money to help uh, us get through, get through the year. Uh, we do get uh, federal money and state money, and we use that to help, uh, help the citizens of Minot. Every day, uh, we provide about 330 meals on average to our home delivered clients, and we do another 80 uh, uh, congregate meals at our site. So we're doing a lot for the citizens of Minot, and and, when, and I know a lot of you went on our uh, March for Meals uh, this year, and I appreciate that, and you saw how we do that and how we uh, interact with our citizens. And it's, it's more than just a meal. Um, it's a, it's a wellness check every day. Um, we have a lot of volunteers that have built up relationships with these, uh, with these uh, seniors that we, we deliver to. Um, they know them, they know, uh, you know what's gonna happen that day. And then we also have stuff in, in place that if, if something's not right, that we can help that senior out. Whether that's to make a phone call to uh, their emergency contact, uh, call the fire department, call paramedics, call the police, whatever that, that situation is, we can help, help that senior out. So it's more than just a meal, it's that wellness check every day that we see that, that senior. We also do health and foot care clinics. Um, and, and those clinics are very, very important. Uh, a person's health uh, is, is gauged by their feet. Uh, we have nurses that, that see about Oh, probably about 250 to 300 clients a month on foot care. And we do that not only at the Parker, but we do in-home visits for those that can't make it out of their homes. So those nurses take care of those, those clients that can't, can't take care of their feet and uh, make recommendations to the, those clients that might need some specialized treatment or something like that. So, so they help them out in their, in their health clinics. 
Now we do this uh, throughout the city. Uh, we, we provide meals, we, we do it every day. Um, during the pandemic, um, sometimes we're, we're doing two hot meals a day during the pandemic so that seniors were taken care of and that they got, got what they needed because lots of them were scared to go to the grocery store. So we were trying to help them out and making sure that they were taken care of. By December of this year, we'll probably have delivered 135 to 140,000 meals to the citizens of Minot. Um, and we, again, we'll do that every day and we'll continue to do that. Um, one of the things I'd like to bring up is uh, we were established in 1973 by the mayor of Minot at the time and voted upon by the city council that, that we were a, an organization that the city needed. And uh, so in 1973, um, so if you, if, if you do the math, Scott, you could probably do this even. Um, it's our 50th anniversary this year. <laughs> I wasn't born yet. Uh, I was. <laughs> so I even had hair back then in 73. So it was kind of a neat deal. Um, but so this is our 50th anniversary of, of doing what we do for the citizens of Minot. And uh, we're going to continue doing it. We love what we do. Um, and so if you guys have got any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them for you. Are there any questions, Steve? Roger, um, a question in terms of how your budget request compares to this year's actual allocated sum. Uh, it's it's a little bit higher. We last year we had uh, one hundred fifty one hundred fifty four thousand three hundred dollars that we asked for, so we're up just a little bit from last year. But as you all know, inflation has killed us too. Uh, the cost of doing business, um, our our raw food cost. Um, our, our uh, you know, labor cost, uh, you know, all, all that has risen too. So that's why we went up just a little bit. Um, we, we think uh, that we'll get some extra funding from our federal and state funds too. So uh, the, the good news is we've never had a waiting list for our, our services, and that's kind of where we want to keep it. And I think at that, that would, that's a very conservative amount that we're asking for, and it does help us to keep the services going. So if my math is right, you're asking for something like a three or four percent increase, which is right. below like the cost 3%. of inflation. Yep, yep. You've done. You've tightened your belt, certainly. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions, Scott? Roger, I don't like to compliment you, but I'm going to. I'm obviously. <laughs> Uh, the services that you provide are, are essential for this community and, and for a large percentage of our population. Um, with that being said, what are, so you mentioned the federal and state dollars, so are you expecting them to step up to the plate a little bit more than, than in the past? Yes, um, we, we are. Uh, the state did, did add some money to our budget this year. Um, but what that does is, is make us even for when the pandemic was going on and we, we got additional federal dollars. So, so now we're, we're about even for where we were last year and, and two years ago. Uh, some of the things that, um, you know, that, that kind of, kind of play, play out in here is that um, Title III programs are, um, are, people are eligible for Title III programs if they're 60 or over. So some of you up there are 60 or over. I don't want to mention any names, but Mark. Um, <laughs> you are eligible for the <laughs> services and, uh, and, and, and it, just because you're 60 year over, you're, you're eligible. Uh, we don't do a means test. We don't, don't do any of that. And we're only, because it's a federal program, we're only allowed to ask for a donation. Donations have went down. We were probably at the 250 uh, a meal donation, and we're now at about $1.59 per meal. So, so donations have went down, and we all know why that is. Uh, everything else for seniors has gone up. They're on, they're on a fixed income. Um, so by helping them out with meals and other services that, that we can provide, maybe that keeps them in their homes a little bit longer, maybe that helps them get their medication, that type of stuff, pay rent. So that's what we're, we're doing here. Any other questions? Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Next up for their presentation is First District Health Unit. Mayor Ross, members of the council, I'm Holly Breckus. I'm the new executive director at First District Health Unit. I don't have any jokes. I didn't prepare any. So um, I did put together some slides. I see Derek has worked his magic. To, um, 
I want to thank you for the opportunity to come and remind you of what we do in public health and how um, investing in public health is good for the city of Minot. It's good for the citizens of Minot. Um, I don't know, do I advance the slides or does... Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's like the man behind the curtain. <laughs> thank you. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, just to remind you of our mission, uh, public health, we are to make a positive impact on the health um, and welfare of our community through service, education, prevention, and collaborative activities. Um, our vision is healthy people in healthy communities. And when I submitted the request for funding, there was some numbers on the back page. I just put together a slide, just a little summary of the services that we provide in Minot. I kind of lumped them into categories. We have environmental health, we have health services, we have nutrition counseling and supplemental nutrition programs. And then on the bottom there, I threw in our Narcan services. Um, that's not specific to Minot, that's first district in general, just because it was kind of hard to segregate those numbers out. So that's kind of the, the quantitative data. I threw together some examples. I heard the, this term, you know, used about the council aspirations. So I went through, um, I watched the YouTube videos on the council aspirations, so that was kind of cool to, to listen to those. And I found some examples of all the things that we do that help um, with those aspirations that the council has. We share a lot of the same kind of things. So in public health, when, it, when you're looking at dynamic and flourishing, we help businesses train staff on food handling, beverage server training. We establish like food standards that help patrons and business owners. We work with schools, businesses, and a lot of other community partners to provide prevention services like worksite flu clinics. Um, I know it's hard to find staff sometimes, so we want to keep the staff that they have healthy, and we do that through a, a lot of our programming. <laughs> Um, another aspiration was the resilience and preparedness. In public health, we have a, a team of health experts who um, we train in emergency preparedness. We have um, people on staff who are trained in handling, you know, things like floods, train derailments, pandemics, and we have a 24-7 response. So we've, um, I'm sure you're familiar with how we've contributed to some of those things in the past. We work with community partners to plan for emergencies, for example, long-term care facilities. I know just this week we have staff that are going and doing some training with Enbridge. Um, there's an exercise at the airport they're working with. So we just do a lot in this community to prepare for things that may, may happen. We hope they never do, but we like to be prepared. And in talking about resilience, you know, we've worked with businesses and schools to do some recovery from disasters. Um, you know, everybody's familiar with the, the work we did with the pandemic. Um, looking at safe and welcoming aspirations, we do a lot with harm reduction. We have the Good Neighbors program. We do Narcan training. We worked with the fire department on leave behind programs. We monitor and treat communicable diseases. We do a lot of community and um, educations in the school around basic things like bike safety, distracted driving. We've partnered with NDSU on doing in the move in schools where it promotes physical activity with students. Um, the list goes on and on. And you know, topic what was hot today was about inclusion, diversity. We work with all kinds of diverse populations. We, we have a translation service. We can work with anybody's language that they have. Um, you know, we, we serve every single resident in our service area, and that includes everybody in the city of Minot. So we're very, um, we try hard to include everybody in all the programs that we do. And the last aspiration is, you know, excellent and connected. We also strive for excellence in our service. Um, we do that day in and day out. One of the things that we really do, talking about connectedness, is we serve as a resource for all of our um, clients that come in, if they need, you know, help finding he heating assistance, we send them there. We, you know, send them down to certain healthcare providers. We work with uh, numerous members of the community, partners like Minot Public School. We partner with school nursing. We partner with Trinity and in the injury prevention. 
We partner with UND Center for Maui Family Medicine, working with their residents and also with MSU nursing students. Um, the list goes on and on. And we also share the, the city's philosophy of uh, fiscal responsibility. We, you know, we're not just free services. We do charge consumer fees, and about a third of our funding does come from that. People who have the ability to pay, they do pay for our services. So I just threw up the slide, and it's a little bit hard to see. But looking at where our revenue comes from, a third of it comes from consumer fees. We get money from state and federal grants as well. Um, City, you guys have co contributed in the past. We get a little money from the counties as well. And that basically, you know, funds our expenses, which most of that is our staffing. You know, the boots on the ground, people out there doing the work in public health. And here's our management team. We have a team of experts there that different, you know, emergency response, nutrition, environmental, nursing services, and there's my contact information. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. If I don't have the answers, I can surely try to find those for you. Being new, there's probably things I don't have the history behind that Lisa did. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? Steve. Two, uh, what's the Leave Behind program you do with our firefighters? Oh, OK. So we were partnered with the fire department, and we um, they have kits of Narcan they leave with instructions on how to oh, use okay. Narcan and things, and they train um, the family and friends on site who, you know, that might be at high risk of overdosing again. Okay. It's kind of like an a education on the go pro program. And the second thing is you're asking for $34,000 more than last year, correct? Um, we had 118 last year. That was 300 from us, and you're asking for 334 this year. Am I missing something? It was 318, I believe, last year. Okay. Yeah, remember, we reinstated. We had okay. taken it down, and then um, we had Yeah, so it was 318 it. last year, and this year it's, th it's 334, we're asking. It's about a 5% increase. So again, very small and below the cost of inflation. Yes. Thank you. Scott. I just want to say again, um, you know, first off, welcome to your job. And, Thank you. <laughs> uh, we're all here to support you in any ways you need, and, and please feel free to reach out to me personally as somebody that's been around this field a little bit for anything I can help you with. Um, the, the services you provide save lives. I, I, we're doing some remodeling at my work right now, and um, one of the things we had to decide was where where is the best places to put Narcan in our office. And I'm, I'm first off blessed that we haven't had to use it but I'm even more blessed that we have it just in case we ever do. And, and that's thanks to the services that you provided. So, and, and your agency has provided. So let's keep doing that. Let's try and keep people alive and safe and living in our community. So thank you for everything. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Next up is the uh, Minot Area Chamber. Oh, I'm sorry, Project B. I had to check that. I'm sorry. My bad. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Liz Larson. I'm the executive director of Project B. Um, we started out in 1910-ish as the YWCA of Minot. Um, before women had the right to vote, there was a group of women who thought that we needed to do more for our community. Um, we used to be on Main Street in where Anderson's Bootery is, like on the second floor. Um, over the years, we've had a daycare. We've had emergency shelter for women and children. Um, in 2020, just with everything with COVID, we kind of looked at ourselves and we saw the need for more services. We saw the need just to be better than we were. Um, otherwise, we would end up like some of the other organizations that were filing bankruptcy or not being able to find funds for their programming. So in 2021, we rebranded as the 100% local Project B. We still have the same EIN that we've had since the beginning. Um, it's just that 100% of our decisions are made locally now. Um, also, at the end of 2021, we took over the Broadway Circle project. We've expanded our program to serve um, anybody, men, women, children. We opened a diaper bank, which is like a food pantry, but for diapers, um, for working families and just families who need help here in Minot and um, the surrounding areas. Um, any questions about our request? We have not received funds before. Carrie. I don't have a question, but I would um, uh, ask for you to amend this to include 
Um, currently, um, your ability to serve individuals in the summer is limited because yes. I know that because we, our youth are not being able to be housed at your place because of a lack of air conditioning. So I would like an amended version where you ask, you get a, a quotes for air conditioning of that upstairs. Because right now we have no place in the city of Minot for individuals who are experiencing homelessness during the summer. You're able to house some families, but there, if you are individual and homeless today in Minot, North Dakota, there is not a bed for you in this city. And the air conditioning is the barrier that limits Project B's ability to be able to house people in the summer. So I would like, you know, an amended grant with air conditioning for Project B's facility downtown to be offered. Absolutely. In our current building, um, if anybody has not been to it, um, you can come see it. We built it about 70 years ago in true nonprofit form. <laughs> it unfortunately does not have an elevator, so it's not ADA accessible on the upper or basement floors. Um, and we do not have an HVAC system. We have non-congregate units that we shelter people in upstairs, and those have window units. Um, it's a little rough. My staff probably hates me because it's hot in there. Um, Broadway Circle is amazing. Um, we're pretty excited to take on that project. It was $3.5 million over expectations, which we've had to raise in a variety of ways, including CDPG dollars being reallocated and then fundraising from private sources. Um, however, the problem, it's not an issue really, um, is that Broadway Circle is specifically for families. And so we will still have an issue with housing individuals because for 20 years they cannot be in that facility. Um, so we will still have our downtown shelter and hopefully at the end of this year we will be operating both facilities. Yeah, Scott. I'm sorry, I have to talk to all my nonprofit people. Yes. Um, bless you, by the way. Um, so, just to talk a little bit about Broadway Circle, going back to, I don't know, 2014 or something like that, one of my first forays into city government or into, these, into all of this fun was the Vulnerable Adults Committee, which eventually put together the proposal that would become um, the Family Homeless Shelter, which is now um, Broadway Circle. And in the process of all that, it's, it's, it's really that ugly side of sausage making because there was many starts and stops and um, you know, it, was, it was difficult to find a local agency that would step up. So we relied on a statewide agency that was 100 and some years old and then went bankrupt. Um, and then Project B stepped in and saved it. So I, I'm internally grateful that you guys changed um, your mission and, and your, your focus in order to, to bring that. Without that, um, those millions of dollars would have not been able to come to Minot, and furthermore, and more importantly, perhaps, is the fact that we still would not have a family homeless shelter. And the story I've used it was many times in this, and I'll continue to use it, was at one point while my, my boys were young, we had some uh, a pair of um, kids staying with us because mom and dad had became homeless, and there was a place for the dad to go, and there was a place for the mom to go, but there was no place for the children to go. And that's unacceptable in a community this size. So I'm, I'm happy that Broadway Circle has, has came along. Liz, um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, you guys done a whole bunch of, of new things. Um, how were you able to do that? What are the funding streams that you brought in in order to do that? Um, so one of the, the greatest gifts um, was really ESG, which is the Emergency Solutions Grant, um, which is a federal level grant for homelessness. They allocated special funding from COVID dollars to be able to get us a little bit extra, which we were able to utilize to really grow our capacity and get more staff. Um, ESG is an annual grant. Um, it was through the Department of Commerce. It's now going to Housing and Finance Agency. Um, and we, we do get that every year, hoping that this year we are able to get a little bit more because they did change some of their guidelines on that. Um, it is a reimbursable grant, um, which means that we have to have that liquid cash. We have to do our drawdowns, um, but we can use that for our staff salaries because we are a low barrier shelter. In fact, in our region, we are the only low barrier shelter that's not DV exclusive. Um, shout out to DVCC. Love or for too. youth. Oh, we're, and youth we're, works. We're no barrier, um, basically. So for um, adults currently who are experiencing homelessness and not DV we are the only option, so we don't drug test. 
Um, we have clients who come to us that sometimes have violent histories. Um, we cannot house sex offenders. Um, there is a need in our community for that. Um, but unfortunately, that's just not us right now. Um, and so because we are housing first, low barrier, we are able to get those funds. Um, that is a guideline through HUD. They really want um, to eliminate as many barriers as possible to housing and shelter. Um, and so that was part of like with our rebrand, it wasn't just a change in name, it was a change in our culture. And we realized that before when we were the YWCA, we were drug testing, we were really eliminating um, a lot of people that needed help. And so we've been able to kind of get past that. Um, a lot of our funding does come from private sources. So we do a lot of grant writing, um, match funds, like through St. Joe's, which is now in Spiritus Foundation. Um, they give us a match so that our donors are more compelled to donate. Uh, the Otto Bremer Trust has been really generous with us. Um, unfortunately, you know, ESG and NDHG, which is kind of an equivalent grant that is housed through the state of North Dakota with some of their extra funds that they had that does not pay all the bills. And both of those, I think both of those, for sure ESG does require a match. So we are still required to come up with cash and show them that we are fundraising. Um, and so any funds we can use as leverage to potentially get more. Steve. I wanted to compliment you on your resourcefulness and willingness to think outside the box, as they say. And also wanted to thank Carrie for pointing out this very big hole in terms of our basic support services. And I would encourage you to come to the meetings of the Human Rights Committee, um, because I think that having a roof over your head is a basic human right. And it doesn't seem like we have that confidently assured for all of the members of our community. Um, the one quibble I would have is with the air conditioning. I know that commercial buildings are set up in such a way that it's very hard to I keep air moving without air conditioning, but as someone who's lived here for 45 years without air conditioning, um, I don't know that that's an essential. I think good air movement is is the key thing, and you know if the only way you can do that is air conditioning, that's fine. But remember that some of us don't have air conditioning, and we manage to survive okay without that. But otherwise, uh, very very impressed by what you folks are doing, and again, your willingness to be innovative and meet the needs of some very marginalized groups on, on many characteristics simultaneously. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? Thank you. Great, thanks. Now, next up is the Minded Area Chamber EDC. Good evening, Mayor Ross, members of Minot City Council. Thanks for having us here this evening. I do have a very brief presentation that we'll go through, I see. Um, the man behind the curtain has left a clicker here. So I'm Brecca Kramer, the president and CEO of the Minot Area Chamber EDC. I'm going to go ahead and just give a baby. Work. There we go. So I just want to give a quick overview as far as our mission. When we merged the Chamber of Commerce and the Minot Area Development Corporation in 2001, we really sat down to see what is our role within the community. So within this, you, you'll find within our application and also here the mission of the Minot Area Chamber EDC. I also have a brief overview on the vision. And that is to be a go-to organization for our business community to drive key initiatives that build and strengthen our economy. And that's a big part of what we do with, through the contract with the city of Minot. I do want to give a nod to our board of directors. Our chair-elect, Cassidy Jumpsid, is here with us this evening. Our board of directors is a volunteer board that gives countless hours to this community to serve and um, to serve and advance economic initiatives forward. And Mayor Ross serves on our board of directors as the city of Minot representative. Our team, we have a tiny team that tackles what you'll see in our next slide, some of our strategic pillars. Um, two of the members that directly serve the work that we do for the city of Minot are Mark Lyman, who is our economic development specialist. He's here this evening. He oversees our workforce and community development pillars. I also have Kelly Roselli Sullivan, who's new to the team um, as our workforce development and military liaison. Last year, when the city of Minot um, pushed additional dollars into our budget to focus on workforce solutions for the community, 
we felt that with our team, we needed to expand that out. So we created a position not only to serve the workforce development, Kelly serves on the um, City of Minot's Child Care Committee, and child care is a big part of this, but also the mil as our military liaison. And you can see the rest of the team um, that we manage. We have Motor Vehicle, which is a separate entity. Um, our five-year strategic plan, I wanted to call this out because when I stepped in the seat about a year ago, um, this was one of our key focuses. And part of our contract, too, with the city was to develop a five-year strategic plan. And really what we've established is our five key pillars with economic development, community development, workforce development, member investor services, and our military support. Might need you to advance the slide, Derek. It's not working. Thank you. Um, so with our strategic pillars, what we've done is outline goals under each of these. And with this, the really want to call out that really a lot of the work that we do on behalf of the community and the city of Minot is a, tied into a number of these pillars. Economic development, you can see that we have three strategic goals that we're looking to accomplish over the next five years. And you can see in our application um, some of the work that's specifically tied into that. Workforce development is obviously not only supporting workforce development solutions, which expands out into childcare, but we're also serving as a liaison for many of the state boards, groups, and entities that are working on workforce development solutions, and we're part closely with those partners. Under community development, we play multiple roles in this space, and again, um, support many of the urban renewal initiatives. We know that the business development work that we do helps increase the tax base and grow um, additional funds directly into the, the community that can come back and cycle through. One of the big things that we do is our military support, and we have multiple tiers that we do this, whether it be through our military affairs committee, our honorary commanders program, programs like the Adopt an Airman, but more so um, is serving the work that we do with Task Force 21, which is chaired by Alderman Janser. The work that we do in this space really is serving as the liaison for the community for advocacy for Minot Air Force Base and its missions, and also in support of the North Dakota National Guard that also serves Minot Air Force Base. And then with our member investor pillar, this is really where we do some of the entrepreneurial programming with programs like Startup Minot. Um, we also have multiple um, programs and events that foster business growth in our community. When I look at some of the achievements sat here in front of you just after taking the position about a year ago, I just want to call out some of the things that our team, along with the 500 plus volunteers that help us work, do the work that we do, have accomplished. The five-year strategic plan is really what we focus in on all the key initiatives, and you'll see some of the things that were accomplished from this time last year when I stood before you. We were recognized for the Logistics Park in North Dakota as the Economic Development Project of the Year. We have an operational intermodal site. We have executed the business incentive agreement with the city that is now a taxable property um, with dollars coming back into the community. We completed, with some help with state funding, a $2.7 million track expansion project. We have generated magic fund requests. I know that's a topic that has been of importance here, that we need to use those dollars to support development in the community. And we've advanced some great programs with the Bank of North Dakota PACE, Flex PACE projects. And work is underway right now with the magic fund guideline review. We're working closely with the city manager, city attorney, city finance director, along with the work that was initially done by the committee that Alderman Pittner sat on um, with the review of the guidelines. We have done a number of primary sector outreach um, through the business retention expansion program that we operate. We operate LOIS, which is a program the city manager brought forward to us and list our properties and are continuing to market our community. We are also a part of initiating and facilitating the Imagining Minot project with a partnership with NDSU. Under workforce is obviously a focus of ours. We've added a full-time position that not only supports workforce, but serves as our military liaison. We work closely with the Department of Commerce along with other state partners on other initiatives. But we did launch this spring the Wayfinders Workforce Program. And we also were able to facilitate $1.8 million through the Regional Workforce Impact Program directly into our region. With military, um, many of you are probably aware of the work that we do, the local, state, and national front through Task Force 21. And I'm proud to say this year we raised nearly $90,000 
through the Prairie Warrior Auction, which directly supports those who serve in the squadrons at Minot Air Force Base. With the governmental affairs work, when I was before you last year, we did talk about that we wanted to be an advocate. That's one of our roles as the Chamber EDC. And we spent time this last legislative session advocating for good business policy, whether it be the business climate, infrastructure, workforce solutions. We also specifically were able to um, generate dollars to help support military, something that hasn't been done for a number of sessions, which we'll get to when I go through the request. So our 2024 request is um, for a 5% increase to the funding that we received last year for economic development. And let me share with economic development, that does include the work that we do supporting the community development, but also um, workforce development efforts that we're, we're heading up. And all of those efforts are identified in our contract. And I believe I'll be in front of you sometime, or the Chamber EDC will, in July to give our mid-year report on the work that's been done. And then with Air Force Base Retention, we've requested level funding. With the access to the state of North Dakota supporting the work that we do through Task Force 21, and also in preparation to prepare the community of Minot for the Sentinel Project, which is the ground-based strategic deterrence project that is coming our way, um, we were able to secure state funds and um, have left this at the level funding request of the 75000 to the city of Minot. And with that, I will answer any questions. Are there any questions? If not, thank you. Thank you. Next up, Minot Area Council of the Arts. To raise the mic to me now. Mayor Ross, members of the council, I am Justin Anderson, the executive director of the Minot Area Council of the Arts, and not to be outdone by Roger, I'll go ahead and start with this. Uh, why did Picasso not cross the road? Mm. Because he saw the Van Gogh. Oh, oh that's better. better. That's definitely than better than you. Roger's. There we go. You'll get one more chance. You can come up and try and improve on that. Next year. <laughs> Like I said, I am the executive director of the Minot Area Council of the Arts. Last fall, in late 2022, we did adopt a new mission that is shown there on the board, Connecting Artists, Building Community, Fostering Possibilities. These three two-word phrases really encompass everything that we do at the Minot Area Council of the Arts and what we try to achieve, uh, building a better community and fostering everything that can be de done and seen in the city of Minot. Who are we? Well, apparently 1973 was a big year for the elderly and the arts because we were also formed 50 years ago, celebrating our 50th birthday this year um, and all the service that we've been able to offer for the city of Minot. We do have over 50 artists and organizational members. We currently have two staff members, and in fact, we just recently took on a short-term AmeriCorps member to give us some help over the summer, giving us three uh, working people over the course of what we do this summer. Um, why art? Because you have all sorts of presentations on helping homelessness and all sorts of other problems in the community. Why art? Well, art has a variety of impacts that uh, have a great deal of influence on everything that happens, from education to resilience, to individual well-being, the arts have a large role in the betterment of a community. Uh, to the point that studies show that communities that invest in the arts are more resilient. They stand up better to challenges. They respond better in uh, crisis. We also offer vibrancy, we offer diversity, we offer everything that a community needs to be attractive to a populace, and as has been mentioned at various times throughout this evening, uh, we do need a few thousand more people to fill some of these jobs that we have in all the help wanted signs. We are able to lend a community the things that people are looking for when they are searching for some place to live. 
I have a variety of data that I've shared with you both in the packet and in previous times that I've been in front of you that comes from an Arts and Economic Prosperity Survey from 2015. We are just now <coughs> wrapping up the most recent AEP survey, AEP 6. We won't have any of those uh, data details until late this fall. But these data points that I use frequently have stood for years. One of the biggest ones being a return on investment of $11 for every dollar of public money invested in the arts. That's a return on investment most investors will not tell you uh, to shy away from. You can't, get away, you can't get much better than 11 to 1 ROI. And we do stick with that. Uh, for the amount of money that we request, the return to the city is great. Uh, we also support, the arts also support over 300 full-time equivalent jobs. And in 2015 was a more than $13.5 million annual industry. Where do you point this thing to make it work? Okay. <laughs> The various programs that we do run include Arts in the City, Artworks and Minot, which is a subscription program for businesses. We have a youth advisory committee that goes by the acronym MACIAC. We have Artists After Hours, and we also facilitate the Main Street Art Movement. And just a little bit, uh, where do we come on now? Seriously. For our members, we provide spaces and audiences for local artists and musicians to showcase their abilities and their work. We provide opportunities for them to build new relationships. For our community, we showcase and add vibrancy to the culture and community of Minot. We build community partnerships and host events that bring our community together in parks and downtown. We build a Minot that attracts and retains residents so that we can continue to thrive. Arts in the City is our biggest forward-facing activity of the year, and that is our summer concert series that comprises of Sundays in the park and Thursdays downtown. In 2022, we had over 5,800 attendees. So far, with five, uh, five, perform five days of performances, we are set to exceed that. And this, if the trend continues, this will absolutely be the highest attended Arts in the City summer concert series that we've seen in decades. This is our 38th year of putting on music in the park and our third year of putting on concerts in downtown Minot. One of our projects, Artworks in Minot, that I referenced earlier is a subscription program for businesses that showcases local art from local artists on display at a variety of locations throughout town. Uh, we will be coming into the Minot International Airport soon, which we're very excited about. Uh, the North Dakota Department of Transportation Driver's License Bureau is one of our locations, and we actually had a state lead of the Driver's License Bureau call me and ask how he can get this in uh, driver's license locations across the state. Um, I told them that he has to talk to the local areas there, but I will help him out as I can. Artists After Hours is a social networking activity that brings artists and community members together, listening to live music, uh, interacting with each other, facilitating those conversations, and engaging actively in artistic expression. We are the hosts of World Fest, as I came and talked to you about a couple months ago. This is a cultural exchange program. We are the proud hosts in the state of North Dakota for this program through Arts Midwest. In October of last year, we had 706 students and 177 adults attending workshops, concerts, and activities uh, with a group from Ghana. A couple months ago, we had 691 youth and 268 adults attending workshops and, co and concerts with a group from Finland. We are set in October to bring Pamua, which is an Inuit group from Alaska, to Minot for a week doing more concerts and workshops. And this activity will continue until the spring of 2025, engaging in cultural exchange and interaction within the city of Minot. 
Uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, we were awarded a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts as the first local arts agency officially designated in the state of North Dakota, thanks to this very council, we were able to apply for this, uh, this grant. This was money that was specifically designated to re-grant to artists and arts organizations through the American Rescue Plan Fund. And because we were the only local arts agency in the state of North Dakota that was able to apply for these funds on a large scale, we were able to award 18 individual artists and 22 arts-focused organizations over $225,000 throughout the state of North Dakota. Many of those were here in Minot, and that was money that was also spent here in Minot. Our Youth Advisory Committee is, gets together to empower creative young leaders to create and coordinate arts programming and events that are relevant to their peers. As anybody who works in any industry that tries to reach any sort of age demographic knows, the 15 to 20 year old age demographic is absolutely impossible to reach. And I have a group of very intelligent, very engaged, and very well-spoken young people who engage in that activity, trying to get more young people involved in public events in the city of Minot and getting them more engaged in the process of what happens. Many of these people, uh, many of these young people are ones that would also engage civically, not just in artistic events. When it comes to supporting local art, I often talk about five different things that people can do to support local art, and really it comes down to two simple words, show up. Visit your local galleries, your, music, you, your museums, and attend arts and cultural events. Purchase art from local artists, not big box stores. Sponsor arts events and programming. Volunteer for local arts events and organizations. And spread the word and discuss the importance of supporting the arts with your friends and colleagues. The arts are an important aspect of our city and they lend so much to what Minot is and what Minot can be. I visit with visitors to Minot on a regular basis and consistently they are all impressed by what the city of Minot has as far as an arts community for the size of this city. We are proud of what we do at the Minot Area Council of the Arts and we have been happy to receive funding from the city of Minot for many years. Our comparatively very modest request of $40,000 may not seem like much compared to larger items on the budget, but it is critical for us to continue our activities and support the vibrancy and well-being of the city through the arts. Thank you. Are there any comments or questions? Justin. Scott. So Justin, first off, thank you for helping to answer the question, what is there to do in Minot, or to rebuff the you know, falsehood that there's nothing to do in Minot. How have you, so looking at what we've had conversations about tonight around um, you know, making Minot a community that people want to live in, and, and, and listening to the presentation that Brecca just gave about the air base, how do, you, how do you relate to people that are coming to this community? How do you get your message out to them? We have, Fairly regular communication with a variety of organizations on the Air Force Base, hoping that they are able to distribute out to their members um, some of what we do. Uh, we also are contacted regularly by new artists that are coming into town. Uh, we frequently have uh, both uh, serving members and spouses who are artists that approach us to ask us what can they do as artists in the city of Minot? And we're obviously happy to answer that question for them. Um, some of them have been major parts of our activity over the last couple years. Um, one who is transferring out to Indiana this month and we're very sad to see her go because she was one of the first people uh, that came into my, my office with that question after I started almost five years ago. Um, so we have that interaction. We also participate in a few other things. Uh, the African American Heritage Council on the Minot Air Force Base uh, has been help to us uh, with volunteerism, uh, particularly with our downtown concerts in 2021 where we needed a lot of help with this big 
blue band shell that we had to put up every week uh, before we got the stage that we currently have. And we also uh, worked with them on some of their Juneteenth celebration that they had in Oak Park yesterday. And so we try to keep those relationships open and flowing so that we are able to communicate as best we can uh, with members of the Air Force Base so they're not stuck out there thinking there's nothing to do in Minot. Thank you. That's all. Any other comments, questions? Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Next up, Service Basin Planning Commission. I'm lowering this for you already. Oh, yes. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is Bracelda Hernandez, and I am the Executive Director for Service Based and Planning Council. Derek, I believe I sent a link for the presentation. If not, that is okay. If, if we don't have that open, I can just proceed. Okay, that works. So, um, our mission as a one of eight regional councils for the state of North Dakota is to support communities, entrepreneurs to advance economic progress in North Dakota Region 2, which consists of seven counties. That's Burke, Botno, Montreal, McHenry, Ward, Renville, and Pierce County. We are the uh, designated economic development district as um, defined by the Economic Development Administration, Administration. And we have the responsibility of developing plans and allocating resources within our seven county region. We offer a, a variety of financial resources to individuals who are looking into starting a business and to existing businesses who are looking into expanding within Minot and the region. We also provide project management and technical assistance services to local units of gov government within our seven county region. In the last 10 years, we have secured more than $38.6 million for our region. And today we are requesting support for 2024 in the amount of $20,000 to continue to provide our services at a low cost to no cost um, for our business community, for our communities within uh, North Dakota Region 2, and also to nonprofit organizations throughout the region. Um, the funds will, pri will primarily be used to cover um, operating expenses, uh, specifically personnel um, and training expenses associated with two of our main services, which today uh, we provided a handout that you should have in front of you that was included in the packet uh, pertaining to our business financing impact in the last three years and also our community builder program impact. So in, regarding our business financing impact, and for those of you in the public, I believe it's in the meeting packet, um, but we do have it. Oh, thank you, Derek. I'll put it. Now if I can, there you go. Okay. But we did include a handout for your convenience or for those of you who are watching online. Um, regarding our business financing impact that we've had in the last three years in the region, uh, we've invested more than $2 million in funding for businesses, for existing businesses and startups throughout our region. I do want to highlight that 82% of that funding remained here in Minot. Um, that funding generated more than 30, $39 million in um, private funds for our region. Additionally, we provided technical assistance to over 120 individuals and businesses throughout our region. That included connecting them with other financial resources. It included connecting them with the Small Business Development Center and just walking through some of their initial ideas. We continue to expand our lending and business support capability um, by not only through the generous support that the City of Minot has provided for our Business Accelerator Fund program, but also in tapping into federal resources, such as most recently the funding that we received through the CARES Act in 2020 in the amount of $1.28 million. 
which we successfully allocated in 2022. And what that means is that $1.28 million will remain in our region for uh, future lending. Regarding our second key service that we provide that we believe um, is provides a great impact for not only the city of Minot, but for our region, is our Community Builder Program, which we launched in 2019. In partnership with AmeriCorps, we help place AmeriCorps members at nonprofit and public organizations throughout not only Minot, our region, but also throughout the state. AmeriCorps members help build the capacity of these organizations in rural communities throughout our region through um, by engaging in a variety of service activities, including communications and outreach, project development, project implementation, marketing, volunteer recruitment, and engagement. In the last three years, we've secured over $600,000 to help support this program. And we're proud to say that we've helped um, 38 communities and nonprofit organizations throughout our region, some of which presented to you today. And uh, 38 individuals served as AmeriCorps members, and they received roughly $310,000 in living stipends um, to help them throughout their service. I do wanna highlight as well um, in the supporting document that we provided out of the 38 organizations and communities we supported, uh, roughly six of those were here in Minot, but I do want to point out that those organizations really service our region. So our board, um, although a lot of our work is regional and a lot of our work stays here in Minot and supports the Minot community, our board understands that in order to have a strong region, we need to have a strong Minot and vice versa. So I do want to uh, thank the city council, the city of Minot for the extended support throughout these years on behalf of our board and our organization. And we would also like to thank <coughs> Councilwoman Lisa Olson for serving on our board and our loan review committee. So with that, I open the floor with any questions that you may have. Are there any questions? No questions, thank you so much. Thank you. That concludes the uh, presentations. We will move on to item number 10 on the agenda and that's liaison reports. Let's start with uh, Alderman Padrigula. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <coughs> I missed last week's um, Commission on Aging meeting because I was at a medical appointment in Bismarck. Um, I did attend this month's uh, Ward County Emergency Preparedness Committee. Um, nothing major, although one of the members of the bomb squad of Ward County Sheriff's Deputy presented on their activities. Um, they have six members on their team, one from the Sheriff's Office, four from the Minot Police Department, and one from the Fire Department. And uh, it's quite a well-organized group, and uh, they respond to reports of suspicious items uh, in the northwest corner of the state. And it's good to have that kind of interagency cooperation. Um, the other group I serve on is the Ward County Planning Commission. Um, I missed one of those meetings again for health care issues. Uh, we're working on finalizing the list of allowed and unallowed uh, activities or land uses in various uh, zoning districts and planning districts in the county. And it looks like we're starting to get close to finalizing that list. And when we do, um, we will present it to communities throughout the uh, Ward County and it'll go before the county commissioners and hopefully will be favorably received by the public. So just routine business there and uh, again learning about the resources available in the public safety field. Thank you, Steve. Carrie. Our library board meeting um, was postponed so um, stay tuned to the Facebook page and the city's website um, for that rescheduled uh, library board meeting. Thank you, Carrie. Lisa. Uh, thank you. Um, I attended both on May 18th and May 31st, um, uh, Alderman Burling Games Child Care Committee meeting, but I did miss the last one on June 15th. Um, I attended the Service Basin Planning Council Executive Board meeting and the Loan Review Committee. And um, a few weeks ago, I met with several downtown business owners along with Mayor Ross, um, City Manager Stewart and Finance Director Lakefield, and um, a variety of parking options were discussed, and hopefully we will continue to discuss those and see if we can find some resolutions. 
Thank you, Lisa. Scott. First off, our uh, zoning ordinance steering committee did not meet in the past month, but the staff are working on some amendments to the commercial building design standards. And the first draft likely won't be available until fall, so they don't anticipate having any meetings until then and sort of the end of this cycle. Um, as Alderwoman Olson mentioned, the uh, child care committee continues to kind of purr along and, and, and getting some stuff done. Um, we're, we're a couple of things we've been focusing on. We really want to get out information. The state legislature uh, passed 67.5 million, I believe it was, in incentives for um, child cares for both employers and for parents, and we want to encourage people to look into that and and uh, be able to use that as an incentive. As I keep saying, I want to see as much of that spent in Minot as possible and help benefit our, our industry a bit. Um, we are working on some surveys that will be going out soon for parents, providers, and for employers in order to gather information about what the current state of child care is so that we can move beyond kind of the more subjective and, 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 you know, hey, I talked to somebody information, but actually get some hardcore stats so that we can have that moving forward. Uh, we did within that too have a large discussion around the need for affordable space. Um, really, really looking at how we can shave the cost of, of the acquiring of space for child cares because the, the economics of child care right now really doesn't work for a lot of folks. So it makes it hard to kind of level up and take on more children. Um, while also trying to pay employees and trying to pay for space and things like that. So we're going to continue to have conversations around that. Also had a lot of discussions on child care at the Minot Air Force Base and, and specifically how that affects base readiness. And, and whereas they have issues on the base, um, it also affects, you know, is, is um, we've heard a lot of the downtown, what happens here in, in town as well. And, and if we can solve issues with child care here in town, it can help relieve some of the stress on the base. So that's where we're at. Thank you, Scott. Mark. Or at this time, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mark. Paul. Um, Renaissance, so, uh, Renaissance uh, Board the, um, obviously approved a couple applications for um, facade improvement. Uh, they have allocated almost all their funds for that program, and they did make a motion to request further funding in the upcoming budget due to the popularity of the program and the garnering the increased interest in the program. So that's what I have. Thank you, Paul. Um, my uh, liaison report was included in the mayor's report. Um, so, um, but before we get to adjournment, I just want to remind the public and the council that we did make changes to the meeting schedule for the month of July. We will be meeting on July 10th and the 24th. So you can mark that down. We'll be meeting on the 10th and the 24th of July. That's just for the month of July. So if nothing else, uh, let's move on to item number 11, and that is adjournment. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, we are adjourned. <laughs>